Hi everyone. <laughs> it's Tuesday, June 26, 2018. I hope everyone is having a beautiful day in the Lord. I have something for you today. I think you're going to find it very, very interesting. Um, it's entitled, uh, Why Do I S Still Sin If I'm a Christian? And uh, this is the big issue in the Christian community. Um, not only on YouTube, but in the modern day church. Okay, you don't hear anybody talking about sin. Um, everybody's accepted. You know, Jesus paid for the sin. Um, you know, we're home free. Okay. Um, and then, you know, a lot of people think that when they come to the Lord for salvation, that uh, they are not going to have to be dealing with this. But, um, Sadly to say, we will have to be dealing with this until we are out of this body. But how do we win? How do we have victory? And what is acceptable to God and what isn't acceptable to God? Okay, so I have some scripture here um, that we can maybe go over together to try to clear some of this up. And at a few points... Uh, when I get to a few points, I have some markers here that are that are going to reveal the um, <clears throat> the, the trap that the once saved always saved people uh, use all the time. I'm going to tell you where these traps are in the scripture where they're twisted when I come upon them. Okay, um, just let me say the Our Father first and ask the the Lord to bless this sermon. Uh, please join me. And we, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Father, for this day and for this ministry, and thank you for all of our Holy Communion and all the revelation that you give me, Father, and the instructions on what to read and what to look up and what to do next. Uh, I thank you for all my blessings, Father, and I want to tell you that I love you very, very much with all my heart, soul, mind, and spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's first go to Ecclesiastes 7.20. And it says, For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Okay, there is not one. The only one who did not sin on the earth was our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. That's it. Everybody else, in God's eyes, is a sinner. Um... In Proverbs, verse 20, uh, chapter 20, verses 6 to 9, Solomon wrote, Most men will, will proclaim every one his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Not one. The only one is Jesus. Uh, verse 9 says, Who can say I have made a heart clean? I am pure from my sin. There is no one that could say that. No human being on the face of the earth could say that they have made their heart clean and they are pure and free of sin. Um, and we cannot clean ourselves of sin. Jesus is the only one that has the power to cleanse us of sin. This is why you have to be born again. Okay, verse 9. Who can say that I have made my heart clean? I am pure from my sin. No one. Okay. Now we we'll go to Romans 3.23 and it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So that means that everyone, the whole entire human race, is condemned with sin. Okay, so now let's go and take a look at We've, we've basically clarified that everybody is a sinner that's born on planet Earth. And um, when we go back in the Bible, when we look at Paul's testimony, we get a good idea that 
um, he struggled with the same things that we're struggling with. So if we go back and look at some of the things that he wrote, we are able to see ourselves in Paul's testimony. And I'm going to be in Romans 7, um, and I'm going to go from verse 18 through verse 25, if you would like to open your Bibles. By the way, I'm in the King James Bible. 18 says, For I know that in me, that is my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. So basically what Paul is saying here, I have the will, I have the desire uh, to do good things. But um, I find that it's difficult for me to carry out what my own will is. And in 19, it says, for the good that I would do, I, the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. So basically, in his heart, he wants to do right. He wants to do all the right things. He wants to please the Father. And um, if you love righteousness, you're going to hate sin. So um, in your spirit, in your soul... You want to do all the right things, but you wind up coming up short all the time, and you don't, you can't carry out um, the good things that you want to do for yourself. So the bad comes in and takes over you. That's what he's saying here. Now in twenty, it says, "Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but." Sin that dwelleth in me. So basically, he's giving credibility to his spirit because in his spirit he desires to do good. And he's declaring that it's not really him that's doing it, that it's the flesh. And in verse 21, it says, I find then a law. That when I would do good, evil is present within me. So what he's saying is there's two sets of laws that are have been prescribed to our DNA and our biology. When we're born again, the commandments of God are written in our heart and spirit. But because we still have to live our life out, in this condemned flesh, there's another set of laws that uh, the flesh commands. So see, God commands, God's spirit commands his laws, and our flesh commands uh, the sinful side of us, which is evil. And all that God hates and despises. And in verse uh, 22, it says, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. He's saying he takes delight in God's commandments that are written in his spirit. Okay? And in 23, it says, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members so he's explaining the struggle he never lived a double life okay paul is describing very eloquently here the battle and if we look back to Genesis 3, 15, it says, And I will put enmity between thy seed and her seed, which is Satan's seed and the seed of the woman. Now, the seed of the woman uh, represents that women don't have seeds, but it's the Christ child that would come uh, from the, uh, the, the bloodline, the good bloodline. Uh, that would come to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So that is where the curse happened, the curse fell, and that is the conflict that Paul is describing, is that enmity that God put 
inside of all human beings to cause conflict when uh, they are uh, they belong to God, okay, and um, it keeps them from uh, going out of the will of the Father uh, through the the uh, empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And um, in 20, uh, 24, it says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh of the law of sin. Now, he's not saying there that it's okay to live in sin while you belong to the Lord. He is just making a declaration that he is going to fall every now and again. And even though he doesn't want to serve the, the law of sin in his members, it's going to happen. Time to time, it's going to happen. He is not saying, now a lot of once saved, always saved people say that it's okay to live a life of sin. But it isn't because Paul is just describing the conflict uh, that all Christians have. Remember I told you it's not a cakewalk to be a Christian, that it's work. Not work that you do to win your way to heaven but work to stay in the Father's will and, and under the Father's law in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, instead of walking in the flesh. That's why Jesus always said, turn, turn. So let's see now, uh, let's go to uh, the Psalms because, you know, after all, you know, we were born into this world. We didn't ask to come into this world. And, uh, but we did, and because we were here, we were all predestined to be here. And especially those viewing this video right now, we're living in the last days. So we were destined to be here. God has a purpose, all right, for everybody. But now we are the ones that have to uh, have some due diligence to do here because the clock and the time is running out. But I want to find out, does God understand the struggle that we go through here in the flesh, and how does he feel about it? If we go to Psalm 103, verse 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14, um, we'll see how God understands our struggle. It says in 10, He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities, because we are still here. And in 11, it says, as for heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. Okay, so now one, one thing we see about God and how he views us um, as Christians walking in, the, in, um, in these corrupt bodies. Okay, he says that he has this great mercy towards those that fear him. Okay, and this is one very strong element to make sure that you stay right with the Father. A lot of this has to do with attitude. And this is where the once saved, always saved people trap other people. Okay, uh, they don't include how you must feel towards God in your walk. And how your attitude must be. Because the attitude is very important to God. Okay. In 12 it says. As far as the east is from the west. So far hath he removed our transgressions from us. So see God has. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. God has removed all our sins. And in 13, it says, like a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Okay? So the Lord will have mercy and pity and take pity on us when we fear him. And that fear represents respect him and his laws, revere him as the almighty creator of 
heaven and hell and the universe and to fear him how powerful he is and that God could do anything he wants all right never ever walk with certainty because your flesh will take you down in a heartbeat and in 14 it says for he knoweth our frame he remembereth that we are dust so he knows what our limitations are he knows um, what what we the battle that we sh we're up against here and um, that's why he sent Jesus and um, the Holy Spirit and um, let's continue on to Hebrews 4 verse 14 and 16 where it says seeing then that we have a great high priest Jesus Christ that is passed into the heavens it's been resurrected Jesus the Son of God let us hold fast our profession what's a profession we profess that we believe in you and that we will we we vowed to follow you not to follow the flesh hold fast to your profession what you professed when you made that confession when you turned to Christ for salvation for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin so Jesus understands completely the struggle of the flesh but he never gave into it because he's God in the flesh but he understands it all he felt all the temptation there isn't a trap or struggle that Satan could throw down that Jesus didn't experience or understand so we have a God that understands. Let us therefore come boldly into the uh, uh, unto the throne of grace. So he's saying here, when we fall, when we trip, when we sin, come boldly to the throne of grace. Come before the Lord with your sin, that we may obtain mercy again from him and find grace to help in that time of need so see it's a process it's a succession it's not once saved always saved because if you stay in that sin and you don't go back to the throne to ask for forgiveness what are you doing first of all you're disrespecting the father because it said that the Lord would have pity on those that fear him and the fear it, it includes respect to revere him as the creator of all things and to fear him and his mighty power so if you take for granted what Jesus Christ did on the cross and just stay in your sin and willfully sin that's not what God plans for you that's not walking in the spirit that's walking in the flesh and another way to look at it is the way I said it before there's two laws there's the law of sin in your members and there's the the law of God in your spirit okay <clears throat> Hebrews 10 26 and 27 for if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries you see this is what happens when you don't make use of the Holy Spirit when you turn your back on what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross and you don't make use of the powerful spirit uh, that dwells inside when you come to the Lord for salvation you know that's Jesus inside of you um, in spirit form and he comes to help you throw that sin off 
this is a very scary verse, people. It says, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. I don't know about you, but that's scary. I would never walk in the flesh or think that I could play in that arena knowing this verse. And how many times does God say, walk in the spirit, don't walk in the flesh? And a lot of these once saved, always saved people will say to those who are trying to, to do right, to trying to walk in the will of the Father, they'll say, oh, they're trying to get you back under the law. Well, I'm telling you something, you are under the law. You're under the law of Satan's flesh. That's what you're under. And you're telling the people that are walking in the spirit that they're trying to get you back under the law. You're table turning. Don't fall for it, people. All you new baby Christians, don't stay, run as far away from once saved, always saved people as you possibly can. Because they are a stumbling block. Cleanse with repentance always come before the Lord to ask for forgiveness and mercy. And that way, the Lord and the Holy Spirit will empower you to throw that off. And even if that sin comes back, you go in front of the Lord and do it again, and again, and again, and again. And eventually you will find that that stronghold that made you sin again and again and again will get weaker and weaker and weaker. And I'm gonna tell you something about the Father. If you don't have a strong personal relationship, you won't know this about him. But the Father is big on persistence. Because when you when you pray, you may not get your prayer answered right away, but he wants you to be persistent because the persistence keeps you close to him, keeps you seeking him, and he keeps perfecting you. Every time you reach out to him, he perfects you more and more and more. It's a process. And so is that constant coming before the Father with your sin and getting cleaned up. It's like taking a shower. Right after you do it, it's like you never did it. And you have a clean slate. Who, who wouldn't want a clean slate? In 2 Peter 2, 21, it says, For it had been better for them to have known the way of righteousness. Okay, let me read this again. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Now, what is this saying here in 2 Peter? It's saying it's better off that you never came to Christ to know him and understand the gospel and the salvation of grace. It is better that you never knew it than to know it and fall away. That's what this is saying. In Galatians 5, 16 and 17, he says, this I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, you once saved, always saved people. Are you calling Jesus a liar? Hmm? Are you calling the scripture out as a lie? Because it says right up straight here, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you believe scripture, the Bible is the truth, then that is the truth, isn't it? There's no way to misinterpret that. 17, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that ye cannot do the things that you would. And I'm going back again to Genesis. The same scripture again to remind you. Genesis 3.15 And I will put enmity between 
the, thy seed and her seed. God put that there. God put that there. And when Jesus died and he resurrected, the Holy Spirit came down to dwell inside of you, to help you. That's why it's called the helper. In Romans 8, 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So this means that if you don't walk in the Spirit, and you walk in the flesh after you knowing the truth, there will be condemnation. That's what that means. I'm going to read it again. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Walking in Christ Jesus in the Spirit. Who walk not after the flesh. So if you're walking in Christ Jesus, you're obeying the commandments of God that are in the Spirit. Okay? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Okay? Because the flesh, that's a different law system. They're different laws. You're under the law no matter which way you go. So don't ever say that Christians that persevere to, over, persevere to overcome are trying to get other Christians back under the law. Because that's baloney and it's false. 1 John 4.4 4 says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit. It wasn't a one-time shot when you went to your knees when you were 18 years old and now you're 50 and you're walking around like a smoker who smoked three packs a day for his whole entire life and his lungs are charcoal that's what you're walking around if you don't go to the throne of God for for his mercy and grace and ask him to cleanse you you're walking around like two black lungs one Corinthians 9 24 25 26 and 27 says 24 ye know know ye that know ye not that they which run in a race run all but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. Okay, so he's saying here, run to win. Run to win. Run, run to overcome. Run to succeed with the Holy Spirit. Don't run to let the flesh win. And 25 says, And every man that striveth for the mastery that means to master it is is temperate in all things now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown so he's he's using the analogy of a um olympic race and he's saying basically that when you master your skill and and your talent to win that prize what you get on the earth to win that prize by mastering your skill on the earth is a crown of leaves and they die it withers away because everything on the earth dies everything and he goes on to say now they do it to obtain the corruptible crown but we and incorruptible that means when you run that race with the holy spirit to to perfect yourself in the will of the of God and push out the sinful nature okay there's waiting for you a crown that can never be destroyed therefore so run not as uncertainly run with certainty that you're going to get that crown so fight I not as one 
that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Now, I keep it under my body. To keep under in the Strong's Greek is number 65299. It's, um, the word is H-U-P-O-P-I-A-Z-O. Hupazio, okay? And it means to subdue the sinful nature, uh, to hit it under the eye, right? Hit it under the eye. <laughs> Hit it under the eye. <laughs> and um it's it's um and bring it into subjection. That means to disable the antagonist. That's what it means. To bring under. Okay, to buffer it. To disable the pugilist, the fighter, to disable him. Lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Okay, this is what Paul is saying now. This this confirms that Paul is explaining his conflict and clarifying that he did not lead a double life. He said, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. I punch the hell out of that sin, okay, until I completely destroy it. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, and he's preached to the whole world in the Bible, I myself should be a castaway. That's what he's saying. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as common to man. That means you're not experiencing anything that anyone else hasn't experienced before. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but uh, will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. So, um, you know, if you're caught in the trap, you know, if anyone gets caught in a sinful trap, you know, sometimes it could take a while to, um, to tear all the tentacles that have now uh, entrapped you. Uh, anyone knows that if they have uh, gotten into relationship with uh, a woman that's gotten a relationship with a very possessive and evil-minded man or a man that's gotten into a relationship with a Jezebel woman, uh, there's all kinds of tentacles that come to keep you trapped and glued to that person. And uh, in your mind, you know you need to get away, that, that, that you're... You're going down the toilet with this person, but yet you can't break free because every time you can see clear for a moment, you go back under the spell. So you have to be very careful about opening doors uh, that are not going to edify you in Christ, okay? Uh, there are many doors that will bring you right into the pit of hell, and it would be a real struggle to uh, to get your head above the water. And um, in 1 John 1, 8 and 10, it says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So the once saved, always saved people that are carrying all this sin baggage around with them and trying to tell other people that because we have a sin nature, it's okay, and you're still in God's grace. I just read to you a whole bunch of scriptures. You call, in, you call in the rest of the Bible a lie. This is what happens when people take one verse and they just chew on it to death and they beat it. Okay? And uh, you have to go to other areas of the Bible to clarify, to make a point. You just can't take one, one, um, one verse and hammer it. In Proverbs 28, 13, it says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, 
but who so confesseth and forsake them shall have mercy. Here it is right there. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. So if you're walking in the flesh and you've trodden down on the blood of Jesus, okay, and you haven't confessed it, and you haven't promised God to let the Holy Spirit help you turn turn away from it, um, they won't have, they'll be forsaken. There won't be any mercy. <clears throat> Let's go into the Old Testament in Isaiah 55, 6 and 9. It says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and our God for he will abundantly pardon. Now this is written in the Old Testament and you can see the father's the same in the Old Testament as he is in the New Testament. If you come before him on your knees and apologize and confess your sin, he will abundantly pardon you. It's an Old Testament cleansing, just like the New Testament cleansing with the Holy Spirit. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So never rationalize your sin. Never justify your sin. Never condone your sin, because the Father knows better than anything you can make an excuse for. And uh, that's all I have for you today. I hope that cleared up a few things for you. Why you continue to sin after you're saved. But you know, we have the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, um, there's, I believe I have another sermon waiting here in the wings. It's called the 12 different ministries of the Holy Spirit. And uh, if you get to know these the ministry of the Holy Spirit, you'll see how empowered you'll be. Uh, that the Holy Spirit, you don't, people don't access and use the power of the Holy Spirit to win, to have victory. And please, people, don't be a stumbling block to baby Christians and to confused people who are just learning about Scripture. There is never any harm in coming before the Lord as many times as you want to say, Father, forgive me. It hurts me that I did that to you. I never want to take advantage or disrespect the sacrifice and the torment that you suffered on that cross to give me a way to come home. Because without me coming before the throne of God and asking for mercy. That would mean I had a flippant attitude, Father. And that's an abomination. I hope you've learned something from this sermon today. I want to say God bless you. I love you. Jesus loves you. Walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. And don't listen to those once saved, always saved people. They're stumbling blocks. Go the right way. Follow the will of the Holy Spirit. Let him lead, not your flesh. God bless.